Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Scotland, the show of train spotting, hardcore techno, and Scotch. Yes, Scotch. Today's guest, Mr. David Allardyce, brand ambassador for Glenn Fittick of William Grant and Sons, is a brilliant gentleman. He has amazing Wu Tang shiny hats. He's a DJ. He loves music. He loves scotch and whiskey and we talk all about his journey as a boy in scotland and shifting to the united states of america most notably texas that's right texas so without further ado i hope you guys enjoyed this chat with mr david allardyce versus Americans. Yeah. Uh, we are, people here are much better at talking about their successes. Ah, yes. And we are like, we'll, we'll hide them. <laughs> Do you tell them you hate them or you just kind of bottle it up and like kind of we build actually, it? No, I, I got feedback from my boss and my boss's boss two years in a row saying, shout more about your successes. Right. And I was like, listen. Sell, sell yourself, right? Basically, and I get it and it, it, it's true, but you know, it can be a bit painful. Just because you grow up and you're just... What, where does that stem uh, from, that I, sense of humility? Is it a cultural I, thing? I think it's cultural for sure because, you know, people are not slow in telling you what they think of you over there. Mm-hmm. And so if you're like, if you're bragging and you're this and that, people people wouldn't take you seriously for very long and people will call you out about it. No, sure, what would they say? It's just a, it's just a, a level of honesty. Right. That is probably unrivaled. But refreshing, I imagine. I love it. I wouldn't change it for the world. Do women do that as well? Like, so you have a bad sexual experience. You're like, you know, you know, look, that was fucking terrible. Um, Not in your personal experience. You're obviously a great lover. And, you know, but <laughs> is but is it even get like that kind of personal and that kind of straightforward? I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I'll tell you, I would say the Dutch, in my experience, are, are even more. They, they're, they're to the point where they'll actually say, like, someone turns up to the office and they're wearing like some really hideous shoes. Right. People will just be flat. Like if, even if you don't know them, just be like, oh man, those shoes are awful. Fucking serious? Like, they, have a, they have a ridiculous level of honesty as well. Bluntness, I would Bluntness. say. That's good, but it's a good it's thing. It's not trying to be uh, rude. Right. It might come across rude to most people, but to them, it's just saying what you see. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's a... We we do the opposite here. Yeah, we're especially just too in the nice. south. In the south. Oh yeah, which which I think is nice. I mean, it's nice to have people that are nice to each other. It you know? is, but at some point you want to cut through the BS. Bullshit. Yeah. 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 It's a good point. You know. Well, so I I love this because I've been hunting you down more or less. I feel <laughs> I feel persistent as fuck about this whole thing. We, you know, every time I've come to Austin, it's been couple of days in and out and it's been fully packed right and to try and even cut find a couple hours was 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 tough yeah because the last time was uh you you were up a little bit more north and you were doing the scotch thing but on a golf course yeah Is that to right? be honest last time wasn't really in austin i was um oh that's right what do you it was uh just Georgetown? uh yeah just north of yeah. Georgetown. and it's a different kind of event but this time we've got some time to talk you've got a nice stint you're heading up to dallas tomorrow You've got the event at half up on Thursday, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Some more space. Exactly. So, I was told by Mr. Fred Parent that I should call you DJ Allardice. <laughs> is, that, is that... So many names. There's so many names. So, the music piece, which I know is a big... I think for both of us is a big element. You grew up in Scotland, right? When did you start doing music? Was it something you were doing at a really young age? I uh, started DJing when I was 17. Okay. Um, grew up in Scotland until I was 15. Moved to Holland for two years with the family. Yeah. 
Uh, when I was about 16, I picked up a, you know, a, a kind of a love for hardcore techno music. Like? Um, Underworld? Is that in there? No. no. Uh, it's way, way harder. Oh. Um, like Rotterdam tech hardcore. Really? Is it, was that, Apex Twin ever that hardcore? No, it's no. Nothing, nothing even close to that. It's okay. Most people, 99% of the world would listen to it and say that's not music. Oh, I see. But, you know, that's ridiculous. That's like saying pop music isn't music, which some people would argue it isn't. But right, as long yeah. as it sounds good to you, what, who, who's to decide? That's right. That's like saying what's the best whiskey in the world? Well, I don't you know, know. everyone's different. Yeah. So this music's exactly the same. You know, people, people are very judgmental about things like that. Was it, was it kind of a musical upbringing? Did your folks play music at all? No, and, and that's like every DJ has on their bio, oh, classically trained. My mother played this in the house. It's like, okay, is that right? You know? Yeah, nothing. no. My, my, my dad's musical. Like, he loves music. Yeah. He's not, sorry, he's not musical. He loves music. Like, he's the same as me. If he's in the house, music's on. If he's in the car, music's on. Yeah, like, yeah. Music is on qua- constantly. Constantly. That almost constantly. sounded like <laughs> I was from uh, There was a Boston. cue in there, yeah. <laughs> That's this cocktail's got me tongue tied. That's good. Um, Until nest and y'all. And so, that's and all. I can't say it anyway. So it's we ended up uh, in Holland. <laughs> Wait, was it work? Was it play? Why'd you, I, was, you... I was 15 years old. Yeah. I went to, I was in high school. So I, I didn't even I only listen to hip hop at that time. First band ever, or first musical group that I really, really remember was NWA. Mm-hmm. And that was because clearly that stuck in your mind, right? Hearing something like that when you're like eight years old. Fucking serious, yeah. And um, it was my friend's brother that was playing it. And we were in the, in the bedroom. And he was just, we were playing the computer and he's like a Spectrum ZXK or whatever it was called. <laughs> you know, you put the cassette in and it loads forever. And then eventually you've got like this really crappy game. But at the time it was the only <laughs> That's thing. That's right. Oh, yeah. Well, we are. So we're roughly the same age. Yeah. So, yes, I do regrettably remember fucking yeah. tape games. Yeah. And uh, we were playing that listening to NWA, so I picked up uh, hip-hop from an early age. That was the only music I listened to. Like, I didn't listen to any bands, nothing. What, what, so what was it about? I mean, NWA makes a lot of sense. It's actually very guttural, very raw, but it, so hip-hop gave you something that maybe rock or metal didn't give you? I did, you know, the, those instruments and, and people singing like that, yeah. to this day doesn't do it for me really it does not it's so it's, there's nobody it's, nobody it's weird there's there's very few bands that I, the older i get the wider my music range becomes okay. right well, that's and, good. And, and more so with older classic bands okay or bluesy stuff and, and i couldn't really name a whole lot of artists but i definitely have widened but i still won't it's not my goal i won't go and pick up a, a cd or download that that particular right, style right. of music it's still hip-hop hip-hop and house and techno and chill out, and anything in that world, I love it. anything electronic. Yeah, I'm interested in from drum and bass right back through the hardcore, back down into like what, ambient stuff. What about stuff like Kraftwerk or Tangerine Dream? That is really that. Didn't, synth- didn't get into that at all. And, really, you know, I know a lot of people. That's where a lot of this kind of music started, but didn't really listen to any of it. Yeah, um, kind of, kind of like I know what I like, and I, I go deep on it. Yeah, um, deep and yeah. Yeah, it, I suspect that whiskey drinkers, particularly too, are very, very particular about what they like. So, so how does this age your social life? Like, what do you do in Holland? And then you, you moved back to Scotland sometime after, I guess, when you, you said you're 15, head yeah. to Holland for two years. I moved back when I was 17, and then met a friend, Andrew Begg, still friends to this day. He lives in Glasgow, and he had a set of turntables. And he was mixing exclusively hardcore music. Yeah, and. We, we both connected on that level, and then... Did you grow up with him, or just kind of meet him when no, you got No, when back? I moved back from Holland, I met him for the first time, because we were in the same class at school then. Oh, okay. I went back to do one more year at school, and then uh, high school. Met him, and uh, yeah, saw the turn... As soon as I saw the turntables, I said, I'm, I'm going to do that. Like, there's no but way... you had no idea, right? Like, I had no idea how to do it. Like, and I was only about a year into listening to electronic music. Yeah. And then that Christmas, I asked for turntables for my Christmas, and I got, we went and picked them up second hand, like came from Craigslist or yeah, something right, like that. Right. And uh, it's like 120 pounds at the time, something like that. Two automatic techniques, not even like oh, proper techniques, 12 yeah. tens, but automatics. That as soon as you move the arm, it starts turning. Right, right. And this, the pitch was a little dial as opposed to like the, the pitch slider. Right, the slider, yeah. 
and uh, a crappy mixer from Realistic that had the little kind of old old school analog That's kind of meters that used to jump up. Yeah, and that was um, that was my first introduction to DJing, and still do it to this day. Still what, love it. When did you know that you had what it took? To well, be a DJ. I didn't. You did. Well, no, but how long did it? You, do you have what it takes? To it actually, it, DJing for me was the same as most things in my life. I was a slow <laughs> learner. Yeah. Like my, my learning curve for a lot of things, uh, and, you know, I don't have a problem admitting this, but even even in the job that I'm in now, like yeah. I was so curved to get going. But once once I get going, like I, I, I seem, it seems the curve seems to become really, really, you know, right. Like you can then it becomes very steep then, and you you figure out ways. You, you I've got a logical kind of more common sense way of thinking, yeah. I think. Uh, and and that, that allows you, I think, to be able to kind of ad- adapt or adopt your own styles of doing things. Right. So I think that's the same with DJing. And I started off with hardcore music and now DJ still hip-hop, grime, drum and bass on occasion, yeah. um, mostly house and techno. So what, what was that scene like? Because it's probably, what, like 97, 98? I think we're both 35, 36, Yeah. Right? So, I you know we were talking about train spotting before we came up here. That's ninety six, right? Ninety five, ninety six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you get in the West anyway. We get this element, or we get this kind of insight into what this culture is like. Was it like that? Were you up there? Were people touching, kissing, moving? Was it like what I would expect it to be? Train spotting? Well, uh, no, no. Your 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 experience as a DJ, like in that era. Uh, well, I mean, just because I was. Playing records doesn't mean I was actually playing in a club. True. So fair. I didn't I didn't play in a club until you know it was a good few years, and it it, it was like dabbling. But we used to go to clubs yeah. um, for sure. And but I think Train Spotting was set in the eighties. I think. Oh, you think you're right? Yeah, because it was a book first and all that. But I don't think the culture had shifted that much by that time. Yeah, because it was still like underground house stuff was still really big in the yeah. late to late nineties. I suppose that it's, it hasn't changed throughout the years that much, really. Really, music's changed a little bit, but yeah. culture's probably fairly similar. Do you, what is the what is the social life like in Scotland? What kinds of things were you doing besides DJing? Do you what what kind of stuff were you doing for a job? At, at that at that age, yeah, at 18, like eighteen. 19? Well, um, when I left high school, I kidded myself on I was going to go to college, and I hated school. Yeah. But you finished it, right? Like under uh, your high school stuff. I finished high school with, you know, the basics. I got the basics in Holland, like GCSEs. Basically, I got seven passes yeah. in GCSEs, um, which is enough to get you into either university uh, or, sorry, college. Yeah. Uh, or into, you know, a decent job. And then I went to sc- high school for one more year and I went back to Scotland and it was a total waste of time because you already were ahead of it right because uh, I went well because I went and joined back up with my old buddies and ah. we had no interest in school starting fights is that something that people do in Scotland um, I mean not not my friends like we were all pretty chilled but yeah um, I wouldn't say it was it was bad at the school I went to you got fights now and again but nothing there was there was uh, there was a gang thing for a while but it, it used to go in cycles it would come in for a year or two and then it would go out um, but no, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that rough of a place. It was yeah. no, it was probably sort of somewhat but average. You, but you don't. It's like, what were your parents' expectations for us here in the West? They're like, you better go to school. No, 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 no. See, it doesn't work like that. No. For, well, it does for some people, but here it's just, it's just this this pathway that's already like the accepted pathway for people, right, which right, I, right. I can't stand. And I think now more than ever, like. Going to, going to university is not as valid as what people used to think it was. Oh, really? I don't think so. No, no. I mean, I don't think not. so here either. But, but is, is, how is it to get a job in Scotland? Is it easy well, to get Well, it a ain't job? easy to get a job if you've got a degree or if you don't have a degree there. There's not a lot of industry right now. Yeah. Hasn't been for some time. Uh, so a lot of people go down south to England. A lot of people travel. There's probably more Scots outside of Scotland than there are in Scotland. There's oh, about really? five million Scottish people living there. Yeah. Five million people living in Scotland. Uh, not necessarily Scottish, obviously, but you probably got more than that living in Australia, US, Canada. Really, just expats. Yeah, right now yeah. people just moved on to uh, other things. But you, what did you move on to then? You just like well, so. I, I, really I did, a, I did a, a whole slew of crappy jobs yeah. for for eighteen from eighteen to twenty till about for about two two and a half years. I, uh, my first ever job 
Well, my first ever job really was going around cutting people's, mowing people's lawns. It's a good job. We all do it. So I, I had a, check this out, I had an orange beetle. Okay. <laughs> my, my dad got me my first car, an orange beetle, which was the smartest thing he did because that car only went 70 miles an hour max. Okay. And that was foot to the floor. So oh, it was shit. a difficult car to get in trouble with, you know? So he's like, already there's kind of some shackles, you know, the car itself, you can't get in much trouble. The car was amazing. But I used to turn up to high school and like, people didn't know my name. Sometimes they would know I was the guy with the orange beetle. That's how beautiful it was. They're, they're iconic cars, man. Yeah, big time. So you're mowing grass. I mean, that again, that's, we all do that shit. I had, had an orange fly mow lawnmower. You know those electric ones? That you oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had one of those in the back of my orange beetle and I used to ride around town. Did they think people. you were coordinating on purpose? God knows. <laughs> I mean, I must have looked like an absolute joke. Yeah. Were you, please tell me you wore an orange vest. Just so everybody knew you were out there and <laughs> didn't run over you with a car. Uh, it was, uh, yeah. Uh, moving on from that. <laughs> I think my first actual paying job was, you know, in terms of like getting a paycheck. Yeah. Was working in a factory in Beath. And it was the most mind-numbing thing I've ever done. What were you, yeah, what were you doing? It was making computers. It was an assembly line. So the first guy in the assembly line had to take this metal base and inspect it for defects. Right, and, right, right. You know, take him like maybe 10 seconds, then pass it to me. I was second in line. And I would actually put in this... Uh, no, I, would, I began by putting in four rubber feet on the bottom. Okay, and that's then flipping, good. flipping it over and passed it on. 10-hour shifts. Just putting rubber feet on? Ten, ten hour shifts. Are you fucking kidding me? I lasted. So after about three weeks, four weeks, I got, it wasn't a promotion, but in my mind, I was like, oh, because <laughs> I had to put in uh, an extra clip as well. <laughs> so they're like, oh, you've graduated. So you get four rubber feet and a little metal clip to put in. And then uh, you get, let's, let's count these. One, two, three, four. Five things, eight, right? Five fucking things. That Six, so I had to flip it over. So, oh, okay. Six so steps. I did that That's for good. 10 hours, uh, night shift. And then uh, in total, the last six, six, six weeks before I lost my mind. <laughs> and uh, yeah, did, did, did some other jobs in between, yeah. like um, delivery driver for the mail, the mail service and all that kind of stuff. What, and then, was there anything that you ultimately were learning or leaning towards? Like, so all these kind of random jobs, no. were they saying like, no. oh, I know what I want to no. do? No. no, I was completely without a plan, without a vision. And which I don't think is unusual at that age. I no, think there's too much no. pressure on people to have to know what they're supposed to want to do at that age. But all you want to do is go out and have fun. Yeah, that's still what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, now I, you've made it proper. I love what I do right now. But you know, getting to this point was just a lot of trial and error. Yeah, there was no exact pathway to this. Although I would say that I give myself credit for. To, to get into this position, like I came from a web design background. Oh, you did? Yeah. So really? when, I, when I moved to the States 10 years ago. So yeah. So why, why did you move to the uh, States? My parents moved here back in 2001. And eventually I decided I was going to move over to and join yeah. them. And I came over and went to college for a couple of years, did web design. Where, where did you move in the States? Uh, Dallas. Dallas. Okay. Yeah. They were in Dallas. So I lived there for about, well, I lived there for 10 years, but I went to college for two years, got a job. In a, in a web design firm doing uh, websites for dentists. Dentists. Well, that sounds lovely. Uh, yeah, <laughs> looking at teeth all day, it wasn't the best. But it was a good, it was a good start, you know. Yeah. And then uh, from there, I got a, a second web design job about a year and a half later. And then another year and a half later, I got another one. And ended up in that time, you know, more than doubling my salary. Shit, in a couple of years? In a couple of years, yeah. two and a half years maybe. And then from there... I was working part time. I got introduced to Glenn Fiddick through uh, Sharon, who used to work for William Grant. Okay. And we used to do tastings at local bars and restaurants. So you would just be out and kind of. I would meet be him. more of a kind of a casual, like uh, show up with the with the with the, the glasses and the bottles, and you would okay. pour samples of people, and you would talk to them very on a basic level, right, right, one on one, and then you know the next group of people would come up and, and stuff. Was it kind of like a whiskey fest, almost that kind of style? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Of how that works. Was, was scotch or whiskey just in general? Was it something that you grew up with? Was no, it's it's bizarre that actually it's no secret. I tell people this all the time. But I moved um, to Texas to get into the scotch whiskey business. <laughs> From where it's made, it is a very interesting counterintuitive. Yeah, it's, move. It's weird, but yeah, like I said, there was no clear path to. I to love that into though, because business. that's. It, it's random. It's chaos. It, it, it was, absolutely. And then 
But, you know, once I was doing the part-time gig, I realised um, fairly quickly afterwards that I really enjoyed the, the whole social aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, I don't mean like just going out and drinking, but <laughs> although that's a bonus, <laughs> but I mean, just deal with people. Right. And I never used to want to work in a bar because the idea of having to deal with people all day, at, at, at the younger days of my life, I was, no, no I was not, I was not thing, into right? that. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to work. I worked in a kitchen for a few years, for example. I would rather work in the kitchen behind the scenes than out in front and yeah. in, the, in the bar. So anyway, it was a, it was a weird transition from web design to to whiskey, but it that is it made very sense weird at the time. Step. Yeah. And then when I went to I went back to Scotland uh, about a year and a half into the part time gig, mm -hmm. and we decided like me and my dad went up to Speyside to Dufton to the distillery, and uh, you know it it's. One of those things, like I hear this from everyone that goes to the distillery for the first time, it's not what they expected. Why? Why they is expected that? it to be more uh, industrial, kind bigger, like more. You know, they, they don't expect the level of quaintness right. that you can have, even with a really Massive large, brand. Success, successful um, malt whiskey brand. Yeah, maybe they're expecting it to be like Miller or something, which is down the street. In Dallas, you know, like something that's more steel, yeah, more sterile. Like a little bit more kind of um, cold and clinical, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's got a lot of charm to it, um, as do most of the stories that I've been to in Scotland, to be fair. But that was, I was probably 28 years old, 29 years old, maybe, when I did that. That was the first distillery of any kind I'd ever visited. So I didn't grow up with an interest in that. Yeah. Plus, I think most people in their, their young 20s and mid 20s back in, you know, 10 years ago, we weren't in a culture that was really seeking knowledge of spirits. You're totally right. Yeah. Or cocktails or beers. Or good stuff. They're just or trying to stuff. get fucked. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It yeah. was just like cheap and easy. No one really put any thought into that. Whereas now you, you talk to young people that are 21 and 22 and 23 and yeah. uh, that are interested about what's in the cocktail or how the stuff is made. And it's pretty cool. But It's yeah. better, right? This oh, is absolutely. A it's, it's, a a better great, it's a great time for... Yeah. Uh, food and drink, just in general, or many things really. Was was Glenfiddich uh, in terms of tastes and flavor profile? Was that the one that it's like, oh, I get this. This really appeals to well, me. Or was it something? It some was other a, kind of liquor. It was the fifth. Well, I before I drank my first ever whiskey properly. Yeah. Uh, which was Glenfiddich Fifteen, by the way, and that was Sharon. She put the glass in front of me, asked me to drink it, and tell me what I thought, and. It actually took me by surprise how much I enjoyed it. Really? It took me a bit of getting used to it, but uh, it was quite nice. And uh, back then I would drink like Carlsberg Lager, which is, I would never touch that now. Yeah, yeah. Like now there's so many good beers that are out there, especially in the US, that you don't have to... You don't have to settle go, anymore. Go, but yeah, that's kind of it. Like yeah. coming over here, if you could find Carlsberg or Stella or Heineken, mm -hmm. that was exotic at the time. That was quality. Yeah. And you no, know, not to diss any of those beers specifically, but uh, I probably wouldn't choose that over any local good beers that you can find now. Right. The whole industry's changed. Yeah, you know, it's changed for the too. better. Yeah. I think so too. What? And, Keeps, you, keeps us in a job, right? Well, that uh, yeah, absolutely. Either whether on the production side or the sales side. But do you ever worry about it getting too big? Because it's good now. People are still getting interest. You know, they're still wanting to know, especially whiskey being the biggest cat, one of the biggest categories. Do you think there's going to be a downside when too many people care, too many brands, too many labels? Mm. I mean, that's certainly possible because. You, you look at history of these things and they typically there's there's cycles where the demand will go up and up and up yeah. and it will probably level off at some point but there's no indication of that happening anytime soon but you never know what might come out in the near future that no one thought of that That's might true. change popular culture yeah. or you know people's kind of tastes so who knows but right now certainly it's it's good and and all the Major whiskey distilleries that I know of are, are kind of doubling down and up in production. Yeah, so I mean, it's, for especially the, American whiskey, like everybody's, yeah. uh, the, you know, you think about Beam, they invested heavily in rye because of the cocktail resurgence, you know? Yeah. So now they got all this old rye. That's like the first time that's happened in, since probably right around Prohibition, got the Pennsylvania stuff. But what do you like about, I love distilleries too, but I like the ones that smell this. They, they, they're vivid, right? They're not sterile. Yeah. But like the first experience that you had, you said in Space Side, 
What was it that you liked about the distillery? Uh, the f- it was a part of the country I'd never been to, for one. Yeah. The, the countryside there was very similar, slightly more hilly, but very similar to where I grew up in. I, I grew up just south of Glasgow in a tiny village called Fenwick. Yeah. Uh, but 15 miles no- to the north was Glasgow, five miles to the south was Kilmarnock. But I was in the middle of the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was very much countryside, so similar to Speyside. So it was nice to see that Scotland's national drink, so much industry was just kind of like created in the middle of this, you know, the countryside. Right. But producing all this amazing whiskey that's being sold all over the world. It was, that was cool. Um, and, and the people, you know, everything's about people, right? And yeah. When you go to certain distilleries, you might not get as a, a personal experience. You know, some people will give you a warmer welcome than others. Uh, and certainly with Glenfiddich and Balvenie and every distillery that I've been to um, within the company, the people that they hire are first class. Right. So they're, they're giving you an amazing welcome and you feel at home. Very warm. You don't feel like it's in and out and thanks for coming. Mm. It's like, you know, it's a little bit more relaxed and um, making sure that people get something out of it. Familial? Would you say just did they? Like, yeah, you're definitely. part of the because scotch is. I mean, a lot of people drink scotch, but with mezcal, with bourbon, with scotch, like it's a family. You yeah, know, not everybody drinks that stuff, and you have you can sit down and be like, "All right, sit down, Dave. Let's talk about this." You, you can absolutely. So I've sat down on many occasions and talked about whiskey related to our brands or not. Yeah. Um. For, for uh, you know, on many occasions for a long time, but uh, you know, you think about. At Glenfiddich, you've got you've actually got members of the original family that will be walking around from occasion, yeah, from time to time. It's amazing, and so that kind of rubs off it as a culture, yeah, that uh, is kind of like actually literally um, a family affair in some ways. That's brilliant. So you said you kind of that first step is twenty eight, and you're doing part time work as a whiskey guy. When did this transition, or was that the next move to work with William Grant and Sons? So in that time that I was doing the part-time tastings in Dallas, every time one of our ambassadors would come in town, so at the time it was uh, Nicholas Polacki was on Balvenie. Actually, Andy Weir was on Balvenie. And then eventually, not long after that, Nicholas Polacki took over. Okay. And then on Glenfiddich, it was uh, Freddie May. Oh, okay. Who's now back in the UK on Drambui. Oh, very globally. good. And they used to come to town. I'd go and kind of sit in on their classes and learn from them. And eventually, I learned, you know, a lot through my own research as well. In addition to these guys, because you said, as you said, you went deep, right? Yeah, I, I found out quickly that I liked it and enjoy learning about it, and then went deep on it. And then two years into that gig, uh, full time, Freddie was moving on to Monkey Shore, and he gave me a heads up, and I put my application in. Managed to get through to uh, the final round of interviews in New York. Yeah. And what do you what do you think your shot was? going to New York, being a scotch guy? I was fairly confident because yeah. I knew my stuff and... You're, um, you're Scottish. I, I just, that helps, yeah. I, I had worked with the company for... <laughs> well, that was a big bonus, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'll get a lie. Uh, but I worked with the company for two years, so all the local Texas team, the Dallas team, I knew them. Yeah. And I knew that they were they were behind me to get the job. So I know I had... And actually, when I walked out of the interview, uh, my boss at the time... Lindsay said she wasn't 100% sold just because of my lack of experience. In the industry and, and, itself, you know, right? Yeah, exactly. You yeah. Look at my, if you looked at my resume, you'd be like, why, how can we hire this guy for this you know, pretty full-on position? Right, like you don't need to put feet on a bottle of whiskey. It stands on its own, right? Yeah. <laughs> <And Sorry. laughs> I got to tie it back, you know? I mean... This is an amazing journey. Like, if you think about it, from there to now you're traveling the well, world. Well, because most, most people that I've met that are brand ambassadors or even in the industry in general, that, you know, they've come from a, a long history of uh, spirits, the spirits world mm-hmm. or the alcohol industry in some, in some way. But yeah, mine was totally unrelated and I just kind of found out at some point that I had a, a passion for it. And uh, anyway, you know, the, the most nerve-wracking thing of the interview process was... Interviews are horrible at the best of times, but when you, I've never flown into another city, never mind New York City, yeah, yeah. to do an interview. So that Just was, specifically for that. Yeah, right? that yeah. was never racking in itself. Uh, but I had to present a Glenfiddich tasting to 
10 people that worked in the office. Oh shit, really? Yeah. So did they give you any constraints so, or parameters? Or like, no, it's like, it? it was un unannounced until the last minute. It was like, okay, we're going to move into this room and we're going to do a Glenfiddich tasting and then you're going to have questions at the end. But, you know, oh, as, as nervous as I was to present, because at that point I'd only probably done a handful of actual presentations to a, an audience right, as opposed right. to the one-on-one -on -one small kind of in a store or in a bar. So, yeah, anyway, it worked out well. Yeah, it, worked, it, it went well because... I got, got a message job. soon after saying <laughs> we'd like to make you an offer. And how long ago was that now? So how long have you been traveling the world talking about Glenfiddich? Well, I'm, I have made some world trips, but it's you know, mostly US-based. Yeah. It's been, uh, it'll be five years in, in February. That's amazing. Yeah. Do you say, how do you feel about your knowledge now versus five years ago? Profoundly different? Profoundly oh, yeah. I mean... It, Self-education has, has been a part of it, but the education from within the company has been huge. Yeah. Uh, we went to Jerez in Spain to see where our, our Spanish oak sherry casks come from. Uh, we've been to uh, Iceland. Wow. Where was it? Iceland? Which wasn't, which wasn't um, whiskey-related. That stuff? was to see Reka. Yeah. Um, where else have we been whiskey related? We've been all around uh, the Bourbon Trail. We've been all around Tennessee. Yeah. So we've seen uh, American whiskey. We've seen uh, the sherry. We've seen many, many Scotch distilleries. I've been to Isla, visited eight distilleries in two days wow. this past June. And uh, we went to Orkney to see Highland Park. And, you know, see, seen, that's what I'm saying. You're like a, ton, a rock star. I've right? seen a ton of distilleries that are, <laughs> you know, uh, very important to, to know about. But, you know, it's, that's the best thing. Like, if I was just going to work for a company and they would be like, you know, here's, here's what we want you to talk about. Right. We only want you to talk about our stuff. You know, we, we, we're actively encouraged to be industry or category right? yeah. uh, experts, if, if you like to say those words. But um, I think that's important when you're talking. It gives you credibility when you can talk openly about other brands. And it's, say that you enjoy them. That's right. As opposed to trying to, let's say, like your, the stuff that you represent is the best you, at all costs. Do you think that's, a, I, I, I think that's a problem in sales. But when you're out there kind of in the market and maybe dealing with other brand ambassadors for whiskey, scotch maybe particularly, and they're just sell, sell, sell all the time. Do you, how do you feel about that? That's just not, just talk it's, about it's not their, realistic. It's not credible. Yeah. Um, nobody believes it. And you know, the best line I can remember from someone that just kind of summed the, the whiskey industry up and how it should be yeah. was Ian Miller, who's our global ambassador for, I think, 10 years and used to manage our distillery and several other distilleries, very well respected in the industry. He was standing next to Richard Patterson, who's the, the master distiller for uh, Dalmore okay. and White Mackay. He's been in the industry for, I think, 50 years now. Wow. So these two guys are standing, and, and some, we're at this whiskey festival in, uh, called the Nth in Vegas. Okay. And this guy says, oh, so Ian, I see you're drinking Dalmore. He's like, yeah. And he was drinking Glenfiddich a, a minute ago. Right. And he's like, he drinks my shit, and I drink his shit. That's perfect. <laughs> he's like, this is, this is what happens. Yeah. It's like, you, just because we're in public doesn't mean that you're not going to drink someone else's brand. That's so ridiculous. If it's good, it's good. Enjoy it, yeah? Yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those things. It's like, you might have a... I, I have a lovely wife. She's beautiful, but I still respect beauty in all forms, right? <laughs> I, I'm not, I wondered where you were going with that. You're going to get yourself <laughs> in trouble here. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it, whiskey is an art. Music is an art. That's I, Which is kind of surprising. To like, now, well, now you're branching out, which is a lovely thing. But good is fucking good. Right, you yeah. can sip a whiskey. I don't care where it's made, but you know when it's good. You you shake at the knees, you know. I think uh, there's there's a there's a similarity between a love for whiskey and a love for a specific genre of music. Sure. Because even if you just love one genre of music, there's enough in most genres of music to go deep to keep anyone entertained. Right. Yeah. You obviously have to have a break at some point and switch it up, uh, but you know, I I really don't. You know, I meet a lot of bartenders that are, they have to know Armagnacs and, and Japanese whiskey, right, and bourbons, right. and everything across the board. Uh, I don't really have that much interest in learning all the spirits out there. Well, you're lucky, man. I'm you interested in deep, whiskey. Right? I'm yeah. interested in whiskey across the board, yes, from any country. Um, and, you know, 
on my time off, I'll have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's balance. Yeah, Dave, that's it's balance. all about balance, right, man? Well, so you're doing the Dallas thing. You've been with Glenn Fittick traveling. You said you're doing the distiller thing. Mostly it's traveled in the States, which is still a very cool thing oh, to be able amazing. to do, man. I've I seen mean, more of this country than most Americans will Yeah, see. exactly. Yeah. Which, which is, doesn't Fun. say a lot about us, probably. But <laughs> Big country, though, to be yeah, fair. Absolutely. Massive. Very true. When did you shift over to Chicago? Was that part of the job, or was it It wasn't, else? actually. It was um, about just over a year ago. I was, I'd had itchy feet for a while. I was kind of 10 years is the longest I had lived in one town. Right. Since I was, um, you know, like a kid, 12 right? years old. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I... The house I grew up in, I lived in for 13 years. Outside of that, I've, I've moved around for every two to three years. So you're used to it. You get this... It, it, it's it, like an right? internal clock. Every three to four years, something would go off and say, all right, what's next? Yeah. And then, But in Dallas, that struck after about six, seven years. But uh, I had started this job, which kept me traveling. So it didn't really matter as much where I lived. That's great. It was just a home base. Yeah. And then uh, decided eventually, I was like, okay, I can move to one, you know, one of two places, Houston yeah. or Chicago. Houston or Chicago? I love, I love you, Houston, but no. <laughs> Chicago is amazing yeah. and it's, it's, it's different enough. Like, yeah. Houston is not, and people from Houston will disagree, they, as well people do. from Dallas. Right. But they're, bo- they're both different in their own right. But if you look oh. on a bigger scale, you, you zoom out, yeah. they're still Texas, they're still somewhat similar. Right. Chicago is a, a major city and also has a massive house music uh, Does it really? tradition. Was that That's before you from. moved? Were you thinking about that? Like- well, a friend of mine came over from Scotland and we went to Chicago eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, we were expecting to find house music clubs everywhere. Not the case. Really? Now, there's quite a few and there's a lot happening right now. But you still have to know where to go. It's not like on every, in every street um, right, right. you'll find a, a club that's playing house music. But when we went there a few years back, I mean, we didn't really know where to go. And it wasn't, we, we asked some locals, it wasn't as prominent as what we expected. We were kind of let down. Mm. But it's pretty healthy right now. But Dallas has a small scene. Uh, there are a lot of people that are into music there, but it's, it feels like a vacuum. It just is so small that the options are slim. And, you know, there's not, as, there's not many many different types of DJs are coming through there. It's right. all kind of like... It's, it's really well, coming upgra- th- in a way, you upgraded. You moved to a bigger city, a more international destination, in a way. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I, that way. I, I When I was born, I lived in a village of like 5,000. Wow. And then grew up in a place of 2,000 until I was 15. Ever since then, every single move that I've made has been to a bigger town. Yeah. And now I'm in Chicago, so next has got to be New York. New York's it? the only thing left. I well, LA, maybe, right? Um, I don't think anybody wants to move to LA. It would, but I would, I would move there, but it'd be New York first, yeah, for sure. It's amazing. Yeah. Do you find being on the road so much? I don't know if you're. I, I don't think you're married. I didn't see a wedding ring. But is it hard to maintain relationships, or is it even something that's worth doing when you're traveling? Well, so um, much? I've been. I mean, in terms of like a relationship with a. Another uh, human being. Yes, sharing a chunk of, of your life. Sex, so to speak. Uh, I have many friends. Yeah, and I haven't actually pro- properly dated anyone for probably two to three years. Yeah, and that's fine because matter, right? when I, you know, people that have a Monday to Friday, quite often they'll go to bed on Sunday night dreading waking up in the morning. Right? Yeah, I've, it's so rare. That I'll dread going to work ever, and and that's the last five years almost of my life that I've still feel that way today, um, which is a beautiful thing. Would so could we say you love your job? Exactly, that's a so, brilliant thing. And and so the traveling aspect of waking up on a Monday saying where am I going today? All right, well tomorrow I'm going to Austin. Yeah, uh, and then next week I'm going to New York, and then I'll have a week in mm-hmm. Chicago. Which with all the travel, the week at home is. So, in, it, it's so appreciated. Yeah, and you love that as well. But um, no, you're right. It's to have any kind of normal life uh, is very difficult. But it's not a normal life. So it's like, what do you want? Do you want the money to Friday? Do you want to come home to someone every and to night? Dread do you it, want to have you said, a regular right? 
lifestyle? Is yeah. that what you're looking for? Or do you want to have this nomadic experience where you, from week to week you don't know where you're going to be and then you, you, you kind of always look forward to each week? Right. Well, so, I think I know the answer for you. It's so for me, it's that <laughs> right now, but there's going to come a time most likely where, or maybe not, but yeah. probably I would imagine you get a little bit tired of that eventually. Yeah. And want, you know, a more kind of uh, conventional or traditional lifestyle. I but don't know. We'll see. We'll see. It's, a, it's an envious, I'm, I'm very envious of that lifestyle. But then again, there's that piece of me where it's like, I like doing what I, I don't want to operate under the confines of an airport schedule. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like having to wake up at this time. And I fucking hate standing in line at the airport, man. Yeah. Do you know the way I look at that and how I, how I soften that to myself is that I never have to sit in an office and I never have Good to point. sit in a car going to work. Yeah. So I'll take an Uber where I can do emails or whatever. Right. Um, to the airport, go through the security and all that. And all the while, if, it's, if I'm getting pissed off with that, I just thank that. Thank the... <laughs> the situation that I'm yeah. not in an office. So to me, that part of it, even get on the flight, uh, it's, it's, to me, it's better than the office. Yeah. That's the way I look so at it. So it doesn't matter, no matter no, what kind of layovers it, it, or anything. Honest to God, does not bother me one bit. Yeah. And I thought that probably by now I'd be sick of traveling. Still not. Still like it. That's amazing. So, um, I mean, what's your thoughts? When you wake up on a, a Monday morning, yeah. what's, what's the first thing that typically goes through your head? I don't think I'm, I'm really in the moment. I don't think about it too much. I'm like, I'm going to drink my coffee. You know what I mean? Like, that's where I'm at. I'm going to watch the news. Like, I don't think about work. You don't? No, not really. I'm, I've, you know, there's this whole saying, it's like, be a human being, not a human doing. Yeah. So I tried to just take all those moments and say, I don't have to be into work for a couple hours. I'll ah, just sit there, drink some coffee that's and great. enjoy it, you that's know? A, that's a, you're at peace with yourself. I, maybe. I'm, it's, I'm, it sounds that way, at least. I, I do feel pretty centered most of the time, but yeah. health is really important to me. Yeah. And that's the thing that's really, really difficult that I appreciate having to go into the office. Because if I was traveling and, and drinking, even if not a lot, it's hard to maintain good diet and like hit oh, the yeah. gym and stuff, you know? It is. And that's it, important to me right now. It is. And I struggle with that. And that's, that's a problem. And, and, and not only that, but combined with what we do with regards to like tonight. Right. I'm doing a tasting that's going to start with a 12-year-old cocktail and it's going to end with 40-year-old Glenfiddich. It's amazing. And it's going to go up from, I think, 14 through to 30 and then end in 40. Now, granted, I don't have to partake in all of this. Right, right. But well, why not? You know, <laughs> I, we're, you're just saying we're only human beings. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to at least have a little sippy sip. You have of to. a couple of those whiskeys, particularly yeah. the, the more rare ones. But uh, if that's a Tuesday night, you know, by the time you can imagine you get to Friday night, I'm trying to go home and chill out. That's right. I'm not, I'm not trying to go out and, 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 you know, it's a completely opposite schedule from most people that I know. Yeah. Which is not, not a good or a bad thing, but it's, it's different. It's just me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of people prefer that, that stability of knowing where they're at and knowing where they're going to be at a certain time of the day and all this stuff. And that may change, man. It's just, it's phases, you know, we go totally. through, it's like exactly being single and stuff. That's a different thing and all that. But so tonight, this it was Tuesday night, you're at Peche, you said you're doing a cocktail with 13, 14, then you brought a 40 year, which is incredible. Or they have it at Peche, I don't know which, but you're also doing an event at half step on Thursday night after a trek on, to Dallas on Wednesday, fucking tomorrow. So you're all over the place, but you get to DJ a Glenfiddich event with Stefan from Last Word and the Boulevardia group in San Antonio. That sounds pretty rad. It's, it, it's a Wu-Tang event again, right? It's not Wu-Tang. It's, uh, specifically, it's 90s hip-hop. Uh, so it's more broad. Yeah. But Wu-Tang will definitely be peppered in there. I'm sure. But no, this is something that's, that's worked out really nicely because you get to combine uh, you know, a bit of my personal life with a bit of my you know, work life, Yeah. which is something that the company has... Um, encouraged for some time and some people are kind of like well it's not obvious to them what they're going to do right, right like well i like to do go to shows or you know do this that and the other how do you for me you it's fairly it? easy yeah. it's fairly easy to incorporate especially with glenn Frick now the, the team that we have they're not as traditional they're much more forward thinking and they're they're encouraging this kind of Innovative new stuff, new innovations, saying, yeah. uh, not only in the whiskey side of things, but in terms of how we approach getting, getting, the, getting the whiskey out there. Yeah. So cocktails is, is completely 
uh, a new thing for us and something that we kind of had our hands on the rails about a couple of years ago. I remember the conversation. Yeah. Like, let's not go down this path. And the world has changed dramatically, you know, the last, you know, certainly five years, but even the last few years. Uh, huge difference in, in I drinking think it has. Food, and sure. uh, with, you know, you feel that, how, how much, how many times in a day do you hear the word millennial? Yeah. And, you know, I'm exhausted of hearing that word, but you get to this point sometimes where you realize, like, you know, you're the same age as me. Yeah. And you realize, wow, there is an entire generation now that is quite somewhat removed from the, the way I grew up. Yeah, oh, sure. And well, it makes you feel really old, right? A little bit. I try to keep young, I guess. I don't yeah. mind. I don't yeah. mind. But it's, it's definitely a thing, like, when you think about that. Because, you know, there was a point, maybe even, let's say, when you were in your 30, 31, 32, mm -hmm. where you were still that young generation. Mm -hmm. And all your ideas were still, like, what was around you. Now, you look around all kinds of marketing and things you see online and, and it's totally different world. It's it's a very and I love it. It's cut it's cutting edge. It's it's very futuristic and yeah. te technologically savvy. It's really cool. Do you I like love the it. technology itself? I do. I love it. Yeah. You know, being in, being in, uh, a massive oh, lover yeah. of techno music. Oh yeah. The whole idea of of everything being on your phone and being so connected to, uh, you know, being able to do so many things. On you know, you think back to computers. What you used to be able to do. It was um, you load it was a game painful from to a do tape. certain things, <laughs> yeah. and now it's like, wow, slow down. There's all these things that we can do that I don't even know the half of it. Yeah, it's a brilliant time for technology, and it sounds like you're combining a lot of interesting things, but things that mean something to you, yeah. the, the analog and the digital. That's how I would put it, right? Because whiskey is analog, Absolutely. right? You, some guys try to automate it. They've got digital temperatures and all this kind of stuff, but like, I'm pretty sure Glenfiddich is old school it's analog there's elements of it that are automated uh, sure. in the sense that um i think they, they made a point where there's there's two still houses one um is automated and the other is manual yeah you know it, it, to me that almost says like you could just have both of them digital yeah there's certain things that i, I don't know that it matters that much but that said there's a Cooperage on site. There's many, many things that are super old school that are still at the distillery. Yeah. Um, but you have to, and I don't think that'll change. There will always be yeah, the, I think the vestiges of the re old retain, stuff. Ret retain a little bit more credibility when yeah. you, you still do things traditionally. You know, when you start to cut out everything and make it very kind of automated, and it's, it takes away a little bit of the romance from it. It does. It totally which, does. You know, it's a, well, it's interesting. So it, it it's been like it's been a really cool chat, and I'm glad that I tracked your ass down. <laughs> Working with your, we've talked for almost an hour already. Yeah, it's 46 and a half minutes wow. at the moment, which is good, which is like kind of what we expected. But so the last thing I've got is a question. You got this amazing tasting tonight, of which there's a 48, excuse me, a 40 year Glenfiddich somewhere in the ether here in downtown Austin, which is an incredible thing. Whether it's in that bag or not, we'll keep. It as it's a secret. not actually. But God damn it! Well, the the thing that's in the bag, you can absolutely taste it. Well, that's we're gonna have to do that. Yeah, I would love to. But you get to DJ on Thursday, Half Step, one of the greatest cocktail bars in the country, especially in Austin, with Stefan doing '90s hip hop, doing Glenfiddich cocktails. So you're pushing and pushing all these new concepts. I'm at a loss to think about what is the post whiskey world look like for you. Is it back to music? Is it back to tech? Where do you think you're gonna go? <laughs> I mean, I think about it um, a fair bit. Because, like you, I value my health. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, it's very difficult to be healthy when the, the availability of alcohol is at your fingertips. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like... I've, I've actually, believe it or not, I've had people say to me, I'm amazed that you don't ever get drunk. And I'm like, well, I do. You just, You're good I at can, it. I can hold it well and <laughs> you probably can't tell. But, yeah. uh, you know, we don't, we don't drink huge amounts on one occasion typically right it's just sustained sprinkled so it across be, the week it, right yeah it's like monday tuesday wednesday thursday you might go out with your friends on a weekend as well just because you know you kind of trying to keep in with your friends and stuff right. like that and, but uh yeah it's sustained so eventually uh the music thing could be but right now i'm in a really beautiful place where i'm able to maintain a lifestyle that i have and, yeah. and enjoy the whiskey world and bring the, the DJ into it. So for now, to me, that's the best of both. 
It's you have like, the security of having the 401k, the healthcare, right. all these things that you, you kind of uh, value from a full-time job. Right, right. Whereas you break away and do something on your own, you got a whole, whole host of costs that you probably don't notice that your company massively subsidizes for you. That's right. And so then it brings out, you have to earn so much more to get to the same level that you were at before. But that's, that's part of making your own business and gambling, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta go all in on it. But for now, I'd be a fool to, to do that, I think, because I enjoy what I do so much. What's brilliant, man. I mean, Glenn Fittick is wonderful stuff, wonderful reputation. William Grantson's some of my favorite people. You know, I've had the chance to talk to Trevor, Wingo, Fred, hopefully awesome. some others too. Maybe Charlotte someday, we'll see. Oh. I'm sure we could make that happen. <laughs> but Godspeed, man. I hope you enjoy the rest of your travels in Texas, Dallas tomorrow, and then the 90s hip hop party on Thursday. Appreciate it, man. I, I love what you do. I think the, the podcast is a cool idea. Thanks, man. And I, I was looking through the, the back catalog. I mean, you've had, it's the who's who. <laughs> I'm of, trying uh, my best. The spirits yeah. world, um, specifically Texas, but yeah. beyond that as yeah. well, it's really cool. Just let me know. You know, I've, I want to talk to more Scott. I really do. Well, that, that we can set you up with. Um, are you coming on Thursday? I, I'll be around for sure. Yeah. Stop by. Yeah. Cool. A lot yeah. of good, good people. So, But thanks so much, man, for carving time out of the schedule. Thank you, Dennis, for allowing us to sit up in this beautiful lounge upstairs at yeah, the Roosevelt Yeah, this, this place room. is awesome. Perfect mood. Love it. I mean, I'm, fall, I'm falling in love with you just ever so slightly just because the lighting's so perfect up here. Yeah, it's almost like the lighting's just very, um, very much calling out for me to pour you a little whiskey here. I think so. Dave, I think that's a perfect way to end, dude. Hope you enjoy the rest of your stay. Thanks Thank so much you very for much, mate. It was a pleasure. Well, there we have it. Another brilliant personality from the William Grant and Sons roster, Mr. David Allardyce of Glenn Fittick. I wasn't too familiar with Glenn Fittick scotches prior to the chat, but David brought out some really, really nice, shiny, special bottles after the chat, and I have to tell you, it is just a luxurious, lush, beautiful scotch and i hope to drink more of it this is not a plug i just really enjoyed it and thank you so much mr david allardyce or dj allardice as some call you for chatting with me it's good to talk about health and of course as a lowly american living in texas it's always wonderful to vicariously live the adventures of a boy growing up in scotland i mean you gotta love that stuff i romanticize train spotting probably a tad too much but thanks for bearing with me mr dj our DJ. So thanks everybody for listening to Show to V with Mike G. This will be the last episode before all of you get to sit around the dinner table with your families this holiday season. I hope you guys have a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, a Killer Kwanzaa, and any other alliterative seasonal greetings that I could give you. We'll be back in 2017. Hopefully we'll have more to say and more to learn. So no matter how much you drink over this holiday season, please keep dancing.